How you doing? <laughs> oh, getting along. How are you? I'm busy. <laughs> Very busy. A lot of stuff with the job, so it's lots of things to absorb. It is. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have the um uh oh, got a we have a brand new uh copy of uh a brand new version of the uh, FlexLink specification. Yeah. Um, is really, and, it, where's this document from? What's what's this nine hundred and ninety one page? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Oh. Um, okay. This is the, as far as I know, this is the beginning of the PDF. So I'm not really sure what the uh, page uh -huh. seven twenty eight of nine ninety one is. It might be. Um, I don't. I. I'm not. I won't speculate. But I, I did notice that. Um. Th th this is the the beginning of the the specification for Neptune, and I just thought I'd, I'd throw it up here because uh it's a uh, expanded from the version that we have currently in the repository, and I I did not check to see if this one had been uploaded yet. Uh, if not, then I'll I'll ask uh, Leonard and Andreas what the what the plan is. But it has lots of new uh, diagrams, and um, uh, expanded uh, descriptions about like the antenna layouts, uh, all the different uh, ways that it can be done, and a uh, expanded uh, space. Oh, so, hold on, hold on one so it's in his, so this is from Andreas' book, then. Yes, but... this is uh, Andreas with with some some with input from from Leonard. Um, is the the essentially the physical layer uh, protocol for for Neptune? So this is what we. Have been using this is a, right. a much this is a the latest version of it so like this drawing is familiar if you if you've glanced at it before but uh it's a so lots lots more in it um the has it changed a lot from the version in the second edition has it changed dramatically it's it, i i don't know because i haven't combed through it um in detail but there are uh so essentially, the, actually, yes. There's one. There's one place where there is a, a pretty significant change. But since we have not implemented forward error correction yet, uh, the change from low density parity check to polar codes uh, was not a big was not a big change for us at this point. Uh, if we had implemented all sorts of LDPC stuff, then it would have been a pretty big change. Um, but not not the basic stuff is oh there, there there are some signaling field changes but those are you know items in the signaling field once you if you've parameterized your uh, everything uh, you know at all then then it's a, a question of just adding new parameters and and putting in new things but the um, things like this which is the the main resource grid are the same this looks. This looks the same to me. So the same resource grid layout for, for any sort of OFDM or LTE-ish um, system. This is the tool that you use to, to communicate what is going out uh, over the air. And that has not, not changed. Um, some more definitions and uh, discussion. There's um, some more drawings. So here's some... And the the feedback that I gave um, when we walked through this last Tuesday uh, is that there's this is a, a really kind of lengthy and and there's a lot of a lot of information in here that is closer to implementation details or implementation suggestions, so guidelines about how to implement things. And I'm uncomfortable with that being in a specification in general. I'm okay if it's like okay, well, here's a, a reference design. But you know, the discussion that we that we had last week was, you know, there's all this talk in here. Uh, you can see it here about a 20 megahertz. Oh, well, this is like a received pass, sorry. But there's talk about a 20 megahertz clock. Um, right. And yeah, a lot of time on that meeting. I I watched that video. Yeah, yeah. yeah so time. okay, good. So if you, if you've watched it, then you you you. So this sort of stuff, I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah, you know. So uh, right. they heard what I said, and um, hopefully we'll get uh, maybe a, a, a more. It would, be, it would be nice to to clearly show like what is what parts of this are really the specification a requirement and a specification linked to a requirement, and yeah, like 
clocking strategies and things like that. I mean, you need you need to have a lot of flexibility in how you implement something. So, uh, in theory, the, this is a uh, both the justification document and reference design and specification all in one. And what we will, what I'll press for is, yes, you can have all of these. The, the explanation, especially for people like me, that that part of this, some of this stuff is unfamiliar, haven't done it before, easy to make mistakes. It's great to have that uh, a walk through, essentially some more tutorial or explanatory stuff. But it needs to maybe be moved off to a second document so that the actual what is literally required, the things that are that you have to have, that that sort of stuff stands alone and and is in a kind of a, a separate document. So uh, we'll see. That will take a lot of work, but that since things are kind of still changing, oh yeah, and this was a I thought this was really cool, Look cool this. diagram with lots of colors and <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. A resource sheet but different. Yeah, this is new. This is a this is a this is it's called vertical and block mapping in payload A and B. So there's wow. two different payloads and they're different, and so this is kind of the first look, the first visual look I think that that we've gotten uh, about the differences. Um, and this may continue to 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 develop too. I, in fact, I know it will. There's, if, as you saw in the other video, there's some things about the signaling for payload A and things signaling about payload B, and that stuff is not not yet in the specification. So there will still be there'll be more versions for sure. The yeah, diagrams like this are new. Um, so that's. Yeah, this is all from from the old one. The, I've, I know this section probably the best because this is where I started implementing was the the um, preambles. And uh, okay, so that's let's see, we're getting on towards the end. Actually, this is I'm just rolling right through. This is new. I'm looking for the SFBC stuff, the, the space frequency block coding, because that's that was what where it was a source of confusion on my part. Um, yeah. First reference signal. Okay, so reference signals are important. Signal field. This would be, here's a definition mapping and construction of payload A and B is uh, not quite, not quite, it's, it's not even penciled in here. Um, this is a conceptual diagram of transmitter implementation. And um, that's that's an interesting diagram because it's it's like a suggested architecture there's a suggested receiver architecture uh oh that's it okay so yeah there's there's some new stuff in here expanded stuff about the space frequency block coding and, and uh, i i don't know i did not when i when i checked last week this one had not yet made it to the to the github so i'm gonna go ahead is there anything i know i just blazed through it um like scrolling pretty fast, but is there is there anything that you were curious about, uh, or wanted to look at in particular, or any questions that you had about the not, spec? Not particular. I mean, the thing is, it's like I feel like there's a lot of this. I just got to build it, and then I'll see how better questions. Yeah, just, I'm so a lot on one level is OFDM. I mean, there's some places beyond just like in SDR for engineers and Andreas's book. And there are lots of places that outline here's what we're doing with OFDM and why. And so theory is fine. A lot of this is just basic stuff of like complex sampling and things that happen whenever whenever you have like IQ sampling and you're using it in these schemes. So a lot of this is just details about how you do these different the phase shift scheme and other things like that. And then how you synchronize that. And so it's a lot, but it's all like it's each little piece. So I, I just feel like I got to go through it more and just do some of it. Like for an error correcting, like it's complicated, but it's kind of like a block in and of itself. So you can kind of put it to the side and say, I'll deal with it later. Plus, there's lots of things that I'm forced to error correct and LDPC code in them. So that's all over the place. So, like the synchronicity, the reference signals, just I mean, okay. there's a lot of stuff in here, but it's none of it. I'm saying none of it's like, oh, I've never seen anything like this before. It's just all putting it together. It's like using all of it. So there's lots of elements to it. Oh, well, it, it, it just feels like something like I just got to go through and build it. And then once I build it, I'll have a better idea. Like, okay, like things like the 
whether we use a local operator at 20 megahertz or use a phase lock loop to capture frequency on something else. That's something you can, you know, once you have it, you can kind of like try it. And then you can make blocks and try it out and see, you know, does, does the 20 megahertz work all the time? What happens? You, there's going to be some point where we make it and we get it to work. And then probably, hopefully, we have enough people who understand it to be able to like, okay, well, let's start tweaking this and see what we can break or uh, where it goes. So, yeah. Questions about like whether we want to do with the 20 megahertz oscillator. I feel like once people, enough people have tried to implement the basic suggested layout, then we'll get enough people, we'll all start asking questions about, okay, what exactly do we need on it? Yeah, well said. I, I agree. I'm, I've, when I hear you, when I hear you say these, uh, when you hear you say this about, you know, get in there and, and try it and see what, see what happens and, and, you know, work with it a little bit before I, I'm solidly in that camp. And so I've learned a tremendous amount already and uh, just trying to go in and, and get a design to, to go through HDL coder from Simulink and, and, you know, see it, it's, it's been, that's, that's how I, that's how I work. So I'm in full agreement. Well, the thing is with the theory, I mean, the theory of this has already been like, they've already, the theory they have is stuff that I've seen has been used in other modulation schemes. So there's nothing here that's like, oh, wow, nobody's ever done this before. It's like, okay, we've right. done things like this, but it's obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a detailed and complex implementation and just getting it into the tube and out of the tube and still looking like sausage or whatever we want it to look like. That's that's going to be that's that's some work in and of itself. Once we get that done, I feel like worrying about exactly how much LO bandwidth and how much frequency margin we need. That's what you test for. I mean, we know, but any, anybody who says like, "Oh, we could just tell the model this is going to be perfect," is like, "Well, you're probably wrong," um, or you're guessing. And so it's like that's once we have some models with this, hopefully we can set up some. The only the one tricky part I feel is like. Where can we go where we can just start broadcasting <laughs> OFDM and not get in trouble with the FCC? <laughs> and that's, that's like, what's uh, the month? We, up? yeah, we, we have, I have a good answer for that. Uh, we can, we can send um, this, this signal um, in the, in the, we can use five gigahertz for, for this. That's, that's say okay. okay. So there's no, no regulatory problem, you know, for, for using this uh, on microwave amateur bands, um, so okay. we're we're good there. Uh, or you know, if you if you had any concerns about it whatsoever, then transmitting uh, into a, a dummy load to where it's only across yeah you know, at low power, it's only across your desk at whatever frequency really you know you you can manage to to get uh, is is really okay you know so not not causing any interference is is a is an important point um but yeah we this is legal uh these the signals with these bandwidths and, and all of this stuff is is totally legal on a amateur microwave so we're in good good shape that up and i was just like okay well, that's, that's just an issue. yeah so, so yeah but good always good to ask <laughs> because yeah. like a lot of a lot of times like the frequency that you are eventually going to target um you know can't you can't really operate on uh you know until fairly late in the process or or after some other regulatory thing has happened and and it it can make it a little a uh, little tricky uh, there yeah. there are there are those situations but we we're we're a okay we're good okay well that's good well then, then i feel like the big step is like implementing it making a good test bench that we can reliably have because that's something we're kind of lack i mean we have that stimulant set up but i think the test bench might be an HDL test bench is probably a better thing going forward because we can make it more flexible, we can make it bigger, and we can try it. That way we can make add functions to like, okay, now we're testing different signal types. Yeah, the, the the sort of the architecture for that, at least from Simulink, uh, is is fairly fairly straightforward. You you set up your the the, the device under test yeah. in a touch te test bench, your design, your blocks that that are that are your design. Usually they're wrapped up and it's it's some block that has lots of other blocks in it, you know, and that's your device under test. And then you have the test bench outside of that, usually. And Simulink does the same thing. So the device under test is a subsystem. 
That's the yeah. target. That's the only thing that goes into HDL coder and the rest of that stuff can actually get turned into a, an HDL test bench uh, as well. So it'll take all of this stuff. It recognizes, okay, this is your test bench and this is your device under test and then it will make those things for you. Now, that whole process is uh, there's lots of things that that can go wrong there too, just like in any <laughs> you know software conversion process. But yes, you're exactly right. That's so we're following the test bench approach in Simulink. Here's the test bench. Here's the device under test. There's a there's lines around it, yeah. two different things, and and you can swap out different devices under test. Then so once you have a, a working test bench and environment that that you're putting in things and you're checking for the output, uh, that's the ideal. Thing to have right and and then you can swap yeah. in different versions of the device under test and you can go ah this one's got too much whatever this one doesn't give correct output uh this one's performance is not great so you can start making uh, comparisons you know in a and we another nice thing about about this is that the ch like the channel models like the multi-path models which i'm very interested in uh in using to kind of push this particular spec and say okay are the assumptions, does they look, is it working out for us in the multipath environment? Are we, you know, the space and the, like the space frequency block coding, is that sufficient? Is uh, the choices that we made on the length of the cyclic prefix, does it all kind of, does it all look good? And we're able to do that because we have access to uh, the, the models from LTE. So the the environmental models, multipath models, uh, channel models, we, we we can use those, their system objects. Uh, so that's all. So we have access to all that. We don't have to recreate that or write those things or go transcribe, you know, multipath, you know, listings or it, we don't have we don't have to do that. We we have access to the same thing industry uses. So I'm just saying, like, yeah, because yeah, with um, simulate, unfortunately, you're stuck with map. Like you got to do everything in map, and it'd be good. Um, and it's not that, I mean, especially at the beginning, the first one, which was just like side waves and noise on them. Those they can, I mean, I can, if I look, took it some time and looked at it today, I can probably finish it tonight and just have like make that an HDL. And it's not like using, I don't need an HDL coder right. to make that. Yeah. A lot of things. So it's like the, it, that's pretty straightforward to build and to write out. And then once we get the basis of that, I feel like some ways it's like, I'm just saying, like, again, like that guy who was talking about class, which I hadn't heard of before, but I looked, I had heard of Haskell and I looked it up because you use Haskell, uh, people use Haskell a lot for database stuff. Cause it's kind of like Scala, except you don't have to pay a tax fee. I mean, a tax is open source, but they had to, anyway, I've heard of people using Haskell for a lot of data requisition efforts because it's been, because it's a functional programming language. So you can write your uh, queries in terms of just functions. And it makes sense that it would be easier to make an HDL coder version from a functional paradigm because you're basically using it to say, oh, here's the math, make a function, make a logic version of this function and you go on and everything will be functioning. So you just hook them up at the end of it. I can see how an HDL coder would have a much easier time building from that than uh, from a paradigm language with for loop and other and XML statements in the for loop where its tendency would be one of it would want to unroll the whole loop. Yes. And, <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, I think you've you've just encapsulated one of the that's a central sort of sort of that that's a computer science thing. That's that's kind of getting right to the heart of algorithmic, you know, implementation and and the differences between different computer languages. It's it's to me, that's that's exactly what you're talking about. Is now, the, the way that HDL coder kind of gets around this is that the the blocks that are that are prioritized are the the ones that have already been optimized for HDL. So if you want to write your now, or you can write your own function. So you can either encapsulate a function that you've written in MATLAB, and that will get ingested, uh, or you use blocks that have been like prefabbed and pre-configured. Uh, already optimized, and these are all of the traditional things that you might expect. Uh, you know, lots of DSP memory signal manipulation, like things like NCOs, that, that sort of stuff. The things you find in FPGAs, mm -hmm. those blocks have been optimized in advance, uh, and the code that that's produced is very readable and good. If you try to use something that's not 
op that's not from the HDL coder library, uh, then it'll it'll throw up its hands and say, you know, I think it'll quit. I, I should try it. It'll it'll flag it. it. It'll give you a warning or or error out. And if you don't use fixed point, then it won't proceed. So you can get pretty far in the process, but it's like, ah, oh, sorry, you know, if you're gonna have to clean up your all of your data. It's gonna have to be uh, sp explicitly fixed point uh, representation. And another caveat is that the the clock rates, the input and the clock rates, the output of your device under test have to be the same. So you can't have a different clock rate in the input side as the output side, mm. uh, things like that. So it's it's limited, and that's how it, that's that's to me I'm like okay, I see now why this works. We have re we've reduced our scope, and we've been we have some very particular things that we're going to ask you as a designer to commit to, and then whoosh, it goes through. If not, error stop, you know, and then you have to go back and fix it and iterate. So they're, they're, they're trying to push a model-based design and using, you know, these, this is how you model it and this is how you design it. <laughs> so it's to dive right in and we can compare and contrast and, and, and make, make progress. Different people use this technology in different ways. I've found out, you know, so, so we're, we're like selling out to the, to the model-based design. It's like, okay, we'll believe you. We'll, We'll take your, we'll take you up on it. We'll, we'll design this in Simulink and we'll, we'll follow your, your guidelines and we'll run it through and get some code and it works. Other people break the problem down. They, they don't use the like an, a model based design test bench device under test. They pick one or two things in their project and they use HDL coder to produce a module, you know, or, or, you know, whatever you want to call it in, in whatever HDL, you know, you're using. And then they'll just, run with that. So they're not using, uh, not in making their entire design, just parts of the design, divide and conquer, and then, you know, using hand coded. So it's whichever works, whatever. And so far we've been able to stick with the, the overall model based design. And, and I'm absolutely sure that we're going to have opinions at the end of this about, <laughs> yeah, you know, about, about, okay. So here's some feedback to, to you guys, you know, on, on how this worked for us on, on a, it is a complicated design. It's a non-trivial design to do LTE based, or well, not LTE, but it's something that is kind of OFDM with LTE, uh, you know, influence and, and all the, the, some bells and whistles and, and the innovations from, from LTE in an open spec, that's a non-trivial design. So, you know, we, we should have some good feedback and some, some good stories uh, and, and feedback, not just for commercial folks that, you know, for this software, but for anybody open source that wants to do this sort of stuff, uh, you know, we already have some some feedback for them on what's worked and what has not, and what what they what they do well and what they don't. What feature sets are really useful? Really is, uh, it, you know, so that's I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be, it's going to be. I mean, there's no one thing. Everybody's going to find different people are going to find different things useful. And, you know, there are some people who will look at, like, build the whole thing, and you can kind of parameter, characterize it and say, like, okay, here's how good this design is when you just set HDL coder to the whole mess. And then hopefully there'll be other people, who, like you said, are taking it from the top. And you can make a block here and say, okay, how, and we can kind of, hopefully, if we, if everybody carefully monitors what they've done with those different blocks and the big versions, we can kind of add it up and see, like, is the whole, the sum of its parts. Or is it less than the sum of its parts? Is it better than like it, are these individual blocks something like does the design get better if we ask HBO coder to handle smaller byte size bits in certain chunks? Like does it do like certain sections better on it? Does it do certain sections better as you take chunks of combinational logic? And does it do other things as better as like, oh, why if you use this for loop as a function that sometimes spits out command signals to other little blocks that do their own thing. So it'll be an architectural question that we love, we humans love to think, oh, I can design this in my head better, but these things get very complex and they have very different needs for each other. So, you know, and the funny thing is like, you know, you can, I, I recently came across uh, Abelson's like book, the lizard book called Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. And what's interesting is they got, they have online the video uh, lectures that Abelson did at MIT 
based on this course. Anyway, it's a whole course on computer science, but based on lit, which was an interesting choice, even in the 80s. And but he's so he's like, but he did, but what was interesting was watching him do things that I'd always assumed like I needed like a for loop and showing him doing it in a functional way, like just passing a function to itself, but it kind of does the thing, it still steps through all the things in a loop. And so it's like you can build even the most imperative kind of thing in a functional paradigm. Maybe yeah. maybe that's better for HTL coders. I mean, there are different ways to write it. And I'd be, it's worth trying to see like, hey, if I write a for loop like i is zero, the, 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 the two twenties, run it there, or i is a function that passes an i plus one version of itself to itself, and then you each way you get a for loop. It'd be interesting to see if an HDL coder handles those two identical for loops differently. That's a really and, good question. Yeah, I, the the smallest resolution thing that I've done so far is an LMS filter. Yeah. just a standalone filter and it was it just candled it it was it was one of those that the you know as a as a walkthrough to learn learn about it uh, it was useful to see it happen and, but this was also something that was it was all very pre-selected stuff what you're talking about would sense really really fun to tackle would be to essentially give it some test cases of put very you know deliberately chosen um code and and see what comes out uh sort, yeah. sort of like a spanning set of like okay what how is it how do you do it on this and then look at the usage and and the implementation in hdl if you have a recommendation like a list like you started mentioning for loops that might that sounds that, like achievable if, yeah. if you have a list of if you have a list of things that you would like to feed it to then say okay this is what went in mm -hmm. and this is and then we get and then we say this is what comes out Mm -hmm. Um, I think that would be super fun. So if you can, if you can give me a handful of, of things to try, um, the, I might just actually, now that you're mentioning this, it sounds, it sounds worth doing it. It might be quicker for me to just do it, to be honest. And then, sure. we, and then we have a baseline. I'll do something simple, like three or four things. And I can put it on, I can put the script online or in the GitHub. Yeah, that would be cool. We, that, I, I, I think I really would like to see the results. That's, this sounds sounds super cool. Because yeah, I just I was thinking about that because it's just like there's I, and I kept on going back and forth just because those are the easiest things where like the way you would logically implement like it's something that conceptually is really easy. Like okay, you just add one, you have a counter. Like, right. What could be easier than that? But to a computer program, it's just looking at the math and saying, oh, I got something. I gotta I gotta do twenty calculations here to the same thing, and so. It's a, they're getting better at it. I'm just curious to see like, okay, how did, when it says optimize, what does it think? Right. Okay. And well, let's, let's tackle that. That sounds super fun. I'm excited. <laughs> also, like, I just took a little like mini course on prompt engineering for like LLM. Yeah. So open AI, not open AI, but deep learning and Google just put out their own little LLM called Llama. Yeah. Actually, a llama too and they just were like dealing with stuff like oh here's how you can program this one language model to do something and i'm curious obviously because i'm curious like okay how can we obviously there's things like google copilot out there that they're already doing to do code but the danger i always feel is like they just say oh we're better without offering any metric is like what are we better in like as an engineer, I realized if you're going to get better at one thing, that means you're going to throw something else away. And so better is entirely dependent on what you're trying to do, and what your application is. So yeah, I'm just like, so I'm, I'm skeptical. Like, I think there's a lot of potential in there, but there's also a lot of potential for people to shoot themselves in the foot if they don't understand what they actually, what their, what their personal metric is like on this project. What do we need this to be better at? Do we need it to process faster? Do we need it to consume less power? Can we afford to like, can we afford to spread it out over a bunch of tips if we get a latency of like 10 nanoseconds versus can we let, this is gonna have to wait for a response from the, this other unit. So screw it, let it take as long as it wants. It's, uh, it's not gonna get finished before the other thing comes. In. So there are places, again, where it's like, if we buy it, if we divide it up into little chunks, we might decide, hey, this in this case, 
we like this term, and in this case, we like this term. Functionally identical, but in digital logic, they might be whether we're trying to optimize space or power or latency or whatever, we might choose different designs. Okay. Now, do you have you have access to the to the remote lab machines? A okay, you got an account? I, got, I I did it like I did it like when we last talked, and I like I did it on my Linux machine. Okay. And I got to double check that to be sure. Yeah, double I'm double check, and then what we've done is we we have MATLAB on a dedicated account so that anybody logging in to M A T T Matt, uh, you know, can can take over and and sit there and 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 work with the the startup license to get access to all the tools. So that's an it will be an additional step. So if you log in to Karapi and then or log directly into to Matt. It's a, so it's a dedicated account. That's an extra step that we recently did. I know Talak, and I'm very sorry for Talak. I just noticed you were here because I was covering the screen with another window and did not see her, see you. So no, no I'm so sorry. I would have um, I would have drawn you in and, and recognized you and thanked you for coming. Uh, so so please accept my apologies for the oversight. Uh, but yeah, Talak. No, no problem, Talak. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but yeah, Talak is able to to log in, so he got got into Matt and and is is working as time permits. Um, so, yeah, and then I think um, oh, who was it? It was someone someone else is uh, is spinning up to to work on MATLAB. So so yes, we have uh, this is available, and and then just coordinate over Slack if you uh, if if you have any any trouble. Um, and then what we're doing is just try to log out of the of the account completely, so there's not a lot of extra threads and processes uh, roaming around. So that's a it's not in not the ideal uh, solution for for sharing software is to have a shared account, but the the way that MATLAB is is set up, uh, that was the pretty much the only way that we could figure out how to 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 do it, um, and and well, so far so good. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I have MATLAB on my own machine. Oh, good. So. Okay, so yeah, if you you'll be fine. Then it's, it's I was yeah. I wanted to stop you because I was just like, yeah, 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 um, yeah. I it, have, fortunately, I still have my student license, so there's no problem. They'll probably yank that in about April when they realize I'm not paying you and they'll be <laughs> anymore. Um, but until then, I have a license at home, and there's actually a good MATLAB online. Mm -hmm. Like if you have some kind of license from something that you can grab a hold of, the yeah. MATLAB line is actually pretty you know it's pretty much it's pretty cool. good i've used it a lot yeah the only thing you, that you'll have missing is hdl coder which i i don't know if they does your does the academic license have it yeah fortunately oh. so i can try it out for that and okay so, cool yeah that then just go nuts and then um it, it, it will i'll help however i can or or however however you need yeah no i think that'll be a good i think doing the getting the test was just something I wanted to kind of do on my own anyway. So I wanted to, just to practice that. So I could take it and just throw it in the model sim and see if we had yeah. apples, if we see I wanted to see if we had apples to apples. I wanted yeah. to see if, if I made a model sim code and then if I did it and then if I took the HDL straight from the DOT that the HDL code then I could throw that in and be like, oh yeah, this is saying the same thing. I wanted to check that. And then the second thing was like you said, I think and this is this is just because we kind of came up with this together is the idea of like let me just try a couple basic functional blocks and see what happens if i if i describe it differently because i think there's a lot i know there's a lot that i can describe this in a more functional way and i can describe it in a more imperative way and if i describe the same thing in both of those it would be interesting to see what if that affects how HDL coder spits it out? It would be an interesting thing. And you know, I can figure that and we can at least see if there's some truth to that. Yeah. Really and then it's like, like you said, it's like then I have a conviction that HDL coder will work really well on things that are basically just combinational blocks, but on things that require a little more branching logic where the thing becomes, but basically the tree, the programming tree becomes deeper. That might be the issue. And then what we could kind of think of it well this is part of this is a bigger picture thing but just thinking about using it like okay if it's a tree especially if it's a deep tree then divide and conquer sometimes works really well where you can just snip off fruit in a way think of it like pruning branches and say you take this branch 
because 90 and a lot of programs 90 percent of the branches of the tree you never touch they're like edge cases that are just there most of the time you're going down one path and you just keep going down it. right but, uh, but of course you can't not do the tree you right can't, you can't, <laughs> even though you don't use it you can't you gotta have all yeah. of that otherwise you're just your components are gonna crack anyway yes. it's just there are different ways you can do it it would be interesting i feel to like take what we have and see what we can how how fine we can cut the onion to see like to get stuff and say like okay no these are still working exactly as we think and then once we have an idea of that then people can be we can like kind of tell the community at large like hey you know whatever resolution of block you want to make here's what you're probably going to get and you know, maybe you don't want to make it on the highest level of just like write out the MATLAB code and blah, throw HTML coder at it. You might want to break it down functionally into a little bit more like these little chunks. Like maybe, you know, a lot of times, like now that we got, and you showed me uh, Andreas's new specs, you know, those network, a lot of times I found like when you have like a network chart like that, it's interesting to try to make your function block match your flow chart yeah. in other words have a really simple correspondence between those two because preferably they made that flow chart with a reason of like these are the key functional elements so if you can make your code a lot of times programmers are like oh that's great and then they just dump all of it down into one big thing and they completely ignore any hint of structure that the hardware engineer might have tried to provide for them Right. Maybe that's not a good thing to do this time. I mean, we can check. And then again, this is something we can investigate and try. Yeah. But it's a good idea. It lets us we have a functional outline of how this thing is supposed to work. It might not be a bad idea to try to do it where we make the software reflect what we think the heart, what we think the system is actually doing and see if, again, if that makes the coder behave better, worse. Yeah. And again, all this stuff is. Some of it's deciding what our metrics are. And so I think with the first couple of things, I can just give, here's some choices of metrics. And then as the community moves forward, they can test it for whichever thing they think is more. In some cases, it's going to be obvious what we would prefer the system to do. Like what we, we would do, we want it to be very fast, or do we want it to be very big? Yeah. Another, I mean, yeah. The, yeah. It, and yeah, the, there's metrics at different levels, as 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 I think you can see in the, the recent, um, last week's meeting um, about the spec is that, you know, so it's a low latency uh, uh, spec. So it's supposed to be uh, as low latency as possible. And that, that, there, that, that is the over overarching uh, thing. So in terms of that, but it's also a mobile powered flight device. <laughs> so, so you can imagine that power yeah. consumption is, probably also going to be a concern however it's a drone that not expected to go on long flights uh so maybe so you know it, it's it's all these trade-offs and that's at the macro level at the large level so having but having a low latency mindset only takes you so far because as leonard explained the resource blocks come around at the symbol rate and if you you can if you over optimize it's like, well, you know, who cares? Because you're not going to force the blocks to go out any faster just because you have extra cycles. Now, mm -hmm. the good thing is, is that if you can, if you can get down to as few cycles consumed as possible, you can turn things off and reduce your power, um, and that counts. That 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 is that's all win. Um, so when you ask for metrics, it's it's a very important question. Overall, the guideline is low latency. Anything we we can do to reduce the latency in this particular system will be supporting that that uh, demand and then but don't you know get to get don't get tunnel vision about it uh i guess so well i mean like the things like fpga power on a drone we're gonna have to just put it on one and kind of or at least to get a test board and run it right which is fun will we will be fun when we get there but yeah. it's, it's still things like well, that's just gonna have to wait till that oh like, yeah when, yeah this is a those sorts of questions about like how much power like there is no good there how much power it's going to consume I, I i don't really i can give you just a ballpark and yeah the the fpga stations that we have in the lab are these big boards with lots and lots of stuff on them and big chips so they're they're power hungry that's not the final <laughs> that's not yeah. the final hardware <laughs> it's not going to fly a no. uh, 
a giant yeah. dev board. It would be fun, but uh, you know, that's just to get it to get it working, and then yeah. it's a whole other set of work to to port it to uh, to the final you know chip. Which maybe it's going to be in the same family as the the ADRV nine thousand nine or nine thousand two. That's designed for it to be a mobile uh, radio chip. Uh, but what you know what, and then we'll get we'll we'll get the FPGA that that we need. Uh, so it, it may not be the largest. It'll, I'm hoping it'll be much smaller. So yeah, you're you're exactly right on. The <laughs> We won't know until we build it, really. Uh, and and yeah, to me, getting in and getting hands dirty and trying the stuff and running the code is uh, building things is is that's how we're going to learn and and give proper feedback on the spec. Yeah, I mean, FPGAs are kind of pain, even though the best. There's always once you know exactly what it's doing, there are times when it's just like, hey, maybe there's better like get a little CPU and just have at least mm -hmm. some block. That are just like okay, just run this because it'll be it'll be less. Yeah. But it's like right now we're just at a point where we don't know what it is, so we got to use an FPGA because we got to have that freedom to be able to reprogram it and try it again and try it again and try it again and try it again. And it's just not worth it to do it on a on, to lock it into a chip that is going to be set. But once we get to that point of the things are flying in the air, then we might be able at that point, hopefully at that point, we understand the design and the choke points of it well enough that we can say, okay, here's where we can like, like just offload this into a single block and make it really low power consumption and have it just be this one calculation over and over. It's not going to change, it's never going to change. Yeah. Do this data in and spit it out. And it preferably doesn't have any big control logic in it or anything like that. It's just kind of a dumb number crunch there. Right. That, but that would, but but it, but it would be low power, and we can leave the FPGA to do the things that are still that we need flexibility. To, but that's like I said, that's an issue where we have to understand the design pretty well at that point, and which yeah. block what, and what we can get away with, like things like the F board error correction. That's just math. I mean, it's pretty much it's good. It's pretty math, but it's math. And yeah, it's, and it's and like you said before, it's uh, LDPC, you know, known quantity, yeah. complex, you know, and yes, there's probably opportunities for for optimizing it, uh, but people, very smart people, have been beating on this for a while, and you know, that and the polar codes are are newer uh, and better, um, and some I, I, it's Andreas's opinion that the polar codes are easier to understand and and. It may be easier to implement, you know, but yeah, you're right. That, Like you said, there, you can consider this as a box. You drop in one forward error correction can be dropped in for, for another, we hope. And, and that if you, if you, you know, have your architecture correct, it should be, and yeah, I mean, we, we're changing rates. So you can see some, some adaptive coding and modulation potential here. Um, so that's all of that stuff I'm less worried about than I am the things that we don't yet know, um, you know. Yeah, so, no, it's definitely a problem for a laser gun. Yeah, it is. So, to lock, is there any any particular question or thing you you'd like to talk about? Yeah, I, th I think uh, when when uh, you both were discussing about uh, using the ADRV on the drone, uh, I'm just thinking about uh, if there was any discussion about using the small form factor like uh, Adon Pluto. Uh, for for this kind of uh, uh, application, maybe what what was the limitation which was uh, which came upon on on Adam Pluto and why did we shift to this ADRV based uh, development? Okay, that's a that's a good question. That's a uh, the the late lead uh, Leonard um, identified the nine thousand two chip, um, which is so the nine and in nine zero zero two. So it's a, a analog devices. Uh, uh, chipset for um, mobile uh, microwave devices, and uh, it's designed to to be considered for like handsets and and things like drones. And so he picked it. Uh, the nine nine three six one, which is the uh, radio chip in the Pluto, is uh, a totally fine chip. Um, it's uh, used in in a wide variety of software defined radios, like the Pluto, and many others. Um, and it's still available. You can still 
get the 9361. Um, over time, fewer and fewer factories are, are going to be making it. Eventually, it'll it'll hit end of life. Um, but it's not the best match for, for maybe a, a mobile, uh, small, lightweight uh, device, and the, the 9002 is. So this was, the, the choice really came from the project lead. Uh, and he was like, yeah, this is, this is I've, I've identified the radio chip that I want to target. Uh, the 9002 is is so many years newer. It's a new gen, new current generation of the radio chips, uh, of which okay. the 9361 is a, a, a older older mm -hmm. statesman, uh, widely yeah. used, very okay. successful chip. So so there's there's no real reason why not, except that I mean there there's a few structural differences. There's some bandwidth differences, timing to it. There's difference between the ship, but they're both radio frequency ICs. They're both from analog devices. They're both wonderful. And the choice was to go with the one that was uh, designed for mobile uh, devices. Okay. Got it. Sure. I, I think I have another question uh, on this. Uh, when, when I was saying about the FlexLink standard, uh, I was just wondering when the drone uses this FlexLink uh, standard, will this be your transceiver? Transceiving and receiving at the same time, like the telemetry and the commands going on, or will it will it just be a pure broadcast transmit protocol? So I'll I'll go ahead and try to answer that. The 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 flex link is for the data link. Um, so the there's a, a data being transmitted from the drone, uh, and we're I'm presuming that it's probably going to be video. That that's that's the use case uh, for for this particular. Uh, protocol. Um, the command to the drone, like driving it around or or the identification, which is a separate requirement, a regulatory requirement that drones, uh, I believe, are supposed to transmit their their ID. You're supposed to, what, what you are, uh, I think who is, maybe who is flying it now. Um, I'm less sure about those regulations, but there's, there's, we're talking like potentially three radios. So this is, like you said, broadcast. So this, this is, the, the drone is transmitting, uh, transmitting data, as much data as possible, as reliably as possible with as low latency as possible, because any sort of first person video, any latency is going to, is going to be bad. So we want to reduce the latency down. That's why latency is the, the biggest requirement. Um, so this is the, this is from the drone to a receiving station. And then the command and control stuff is in a separate channel. And that would be to the drone, uh, so there's your, your forward and reverse links, uh, and then a, some sort of beacon, ID beacon that's on the on the drone. That mm -hmm. yeah, okay, sure. Now you could use this protocol as a as a transceiver. I'm I believe. I mean, you it it. Uh, I would probably, if I had to just use it and drop it into a situation where I wanted to to use it like in aerospace, this would be a, a one-way link. You keep it up all the time. You you put in you, the the user data along with the, you know, so you have your reference and your you know your 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 signaling, you know, what is in the packet. Uh, hey, here's a beacon for you to, or pilot for you to figure out your channel current channel so you can adapt and then here's all your data and it's always going in one direction and then you have a complete other you know uh, channel coming in the other way that's how i would yeah. deploy it if i was if i had mm -hmm. to use it so sure okay thanks oh of course All right, any other questions or, or comments? Or anybody well, need anything? So if you could just, uh, I don't know, either message me or email me the, the, the updated question. Yes, I'll, I'll make, yeah, I'll do the, I'll do both. I'll, I'll send it directly to you and I'll also uh, go make sure that it gets in the repository um, so that everybody can have access to it. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it in there already, so. Uh, and you know what? Before I before I do that, I'll double check and make sure that Andreas meant this particular version that I have in my hand. That it's, <laughs> I mean, he sent it to me to review before last week's meeting, but I don't know. He may if he's already put, he's already made updates because he did warn that the signaling fields were not finished yet. So, well, I'll I'll just briefly check with him to make sure it's okay, and then uh, 
it's good to go. And then and then I'll send it directly and also make sure it's in the repo. Let me. Yeah. Okay. So my goal right now is just that this week, what I want to do is um, take that HTL two two things. One, take the text bench and the HTL coder and throw it in the model thing. You just see that we're getting an amplifier. And then try that little uh, sub experiment where I'm taking, um, where I'm just going to try some block of code and just try to describe them differently and see okay. what coder does with them. This is, just, this is just more like a little, this is not going to be directly applicable, but it's just like a little mini case study to see if what I'm thinking is, if I see it, to see if there's a difference that I suspect there is. Or if there isn't. If there isn't, that's a good thing to know too. Yeah. And, and then I can, and then kind of with that kind of warm up under my belt, I can go back to the design and go through it and redo it. And like I said, maybe make it because we have the whole, the whole thing there, but like maybe break it down into more like functional blocks or see if it, see if it, if it, if it behooves that we can, yeah, just see if there are ways that it can divide it to make sense. Yeah. That might be like smaller blocks and then see if HDL coder, what it does with those individual blocks. Just kind of getting a better idea of like how HDL, where HDL coder is with the idea that latency being the prime virtue, just like with risk, where everything was like, why do we do it? It's speed, risk, everything was speed. Yeah. And then everything, so just going through that whole design with the idea of like, where can we, where is late, where is things bottling up? Where can we late, where can we parallelize, where can we release, reduce? And just go for that right now. Go for that as the ultimate, as the as the number one virtue, and then see what we can so we'll see what we can do. I'm obviously not going to get to that end by this point, but the idea of like showing some blocks, getting some ideas, starting to get a process of like so we can spec this and kind of do this, and get a basic test bench framework set up so that it'll be easier to add, like you said, the multi-path models and some other things to it later then those two things I think would be very helpful. And then, you know, and then once we characterize what we have with the basics, then we can start like, you know, Donald Knuth's whole thing about not doing premature optimization. Yeah, we, it's the that's the root of all evil, right? So we can see where the latency <laughs> is building up and then we can work, instead of like trying to optimize everything or just having people look at things and say, oh, we can do this different maybe have a better idea of like here's where we're really getting have a more just felt picture the well not just felt but overall picture of where we might get stuck and where like hey if, if the hive mind wants to focus on something making this counter or this this is where it was slowing down yeah and maybe so we really like and then yeah so i think having a better mode of characterization something that's not just i'm just I guess uh, I keep coming back to this is like I want to like try to do things where we're not so MATLAB dependent, where we can use other like yep. Icarus model sim and just like do baseline tools there, because I feel like sooner or later, as we start building these things, it'll be better not to be like MATLAB was great for development, but I feel like we should be able to spread our yes, that's that, and that's exactly the that's that's our that's the goal. We it's great to have a working model and your model based design has lots of power you know but you know once we get to the point where here now here's the code base in hdl then from there that's your product that's it you know to get to get to progress past your the tools that you use in the beginning to to kind of test your model that's that's a normal thing that happens in in these sorts of complicated workflows uh and yeah i i fully agree and i'm i'm super happy to hear um, you know what you're saying, so I'm looking forward to to seeing it happen. And if we can get the blocks down small enough, then in some cases it'll be very easy to just make it there. Make it there a lot, call it day. But there might be a, and it might be there might be situations where it might be like something. I I saw what you said about my HDL and its limitations because it's not. It's just, you're right. It doesn't look like it's being pulled and supported. Yeah, that was the that was the main the main thing because it was like I was very excited about it. Uh, it's like right up our alley, um, but the sort of the the dates on when it was last updated and the level of activity were were 
that was my my concern my only concern with it so i did not dig in deep enough and well, it's been at least a year maybe two since since i last really took a hard look at it you know so amaranth is under active development though that's that's one that i do keep up with and and we've we have some some knowledge uh in the community about it that's amaranth is what uh, dr estef has used to make maya sdr so it's at least as good as that. Uh, there's some caveats there too, though. You know, going from Python uh, to to HDL, uh, you know, to Bitstream, uh, there it just like what we're doing, restrictions and limitations and things that you have to do and compromises you have to make. Uh, you know, that's not surprising. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you know, that's the thing. It's going to be there, everything's going to have some limitations. Although, if there was a perfect answer, then I think we are all smart. We would be to, doing it. <laughs> doing the perfect thing. It's not, yeah. And that's yeah. part of the issue is that we got to do it. The things, that, the things that worry me or the things that keep me up or most are the things like, oh, um, you know, we need this particular version of Zavato. Like the things where we're stuck to proprietary tools and if we use any other chain, it just won't. Oh, yeah. Still. We, 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 those problems exist. So, you know, then any, anything involving multiple companies, you get things like API mismatches, which we we had to deal with and um, a, a version skew. We have all of that going on from multiple directions and we will continue to have that as a problem, just like the rest of the industry. Uh, and there's version, bad version skew in the open source tools as well. Uh, and it, it it's hard. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Yeah. So I mean, so let's start with what we got. Let's start with being able to see where we're at, right? And what we have with the tools we have, and hopefully, once we make that easier, then as people get on board, maybe they're less intimidated by like looking at the whole block if they can see like, oh, I just need to make this little block in HDL. We can yeah. get more people attacking it, and hopefully, and that's the whole open source magic is the fact that many hands make less work and it's just like maybe we can but i feel like if we can just give everybody a sense of like oh this is really here's how here, here's how you can do it and here's how you can tell if what you did is better than what we already have right yeah we got some metrics you can test on people so, hey if you can get this with the latency of block then you've beaten our you beat the top score congratulations you're at the top of the league yeah uh, but it's <laughs> that's right thing is that i mean because i i mean like a joke but it's like that, no it's uh that's a, to a lot of people it motivates them with quite a bit and that's really what it's about is you know making you, you want your design to be the best possible it's yeah, yeah, abnormal yeah. everybody yeah. wants to be the top of the list i mean we're all of the generation that we remember like arcade and video games to the point where it's just like you know that was a big goal for a lot of us as children the biggest thing we were hoping to accomplish was to get our name, our three, our three little letters. That's right. On top of that list, whatever that particular game was. So just like I think that's very inbred, inbuilt. That's that experience is built in. So if we can make our design experience mimic that, I think that helps people. Like nowadays, people say like talk about games, and they're like, "Are you winning?" And I'm like, "Well, that's not really the point anymore." But it used to be. <laughs> You yeah. Be, it was like there was a score, and you knew whether you were better than the other person because there was one number, a nice integer number, that told you exactly whether you had done better than anybody else. So yep. If we could do it to that. If we could reduce it to that, hopefully other people can dive in and be like, okay, it's not as scary. And yeah. Being able to plug in and and to show up and to contribute in a to a complex project with an organized small little uh, block is a uh, that's a that's a very worthy goal. Uh, it's going to be very hard to pull off, uh, but I think we're up to the challenge. So let's let's see what oh. we can do. And and uh, is this time day okay to to oh, yeah. schedule good. something next week? Is next week good? Uh, yeah, this is good time. Like Mondays are always going to be off for me. Fortunately, okay. You know, I'm working a four ten week now, so it's Tuesdays through Fridays. So I always have Mondays off. Uh, yeah, so Mondays will be clear for me. Okay, I'll go ahead and schedule it. Hopefully, I'll get the the number of the day correct this time, so, <laughs> so that I reduce the confusion. Well, I, think I, thought, but I was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, it's yeah. not enough coffee. I think was the problem. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but okay, well, yeah, let's uh, 
let's go and, and kick some butt this week and see what we can accomplish and, and get back, get back next week and, and, uh, and, and meet up and, and, uh, yeah. keep it, keep it going. So thank you. This is a uh, pretty cool. All right. Any, any, anybody need anything, any resources or anything they need? Cool. Okay. I got to see, see you all on Slack then. Thank you. Bye -bye. You bet.